like you, but I hate it when looking forward to hearing a wonderful speaker and then somebody gets up here with a long-winded introduction of them. So if you feel the same way, I can feel your pain. <laughs> I totally empathize. However, <laughs> I have so many wonderful things to say about Pete and Ed that I just can't control myself. So I first heard about this dynamic duo when I wrote a letter to Gene about ooh, 30 years ago asking him if he knew anybody who was into focusing and spirituality. So he wrote me back and says, well, you have to look up Pete and Ed. They're the guys who are really into this. So I contacted them and they told me about a workshop they were doing and I signed up for their workshop. And I can't tell you how impressed I was with their workshop how clearly they articulated the connection between focusing and spirituality. I was just really touched in a really deep way by that. And not only focusing on Christian spirituality, I might add, but more, more centrally, a bio-spirituality, a global spirituality that transcends denominational divisions. Because I was into the whole ecumenical thing and they really embodied that for me. So then I read their incredible book, Biospirituality, Focusing as a Way to Grow, and I was really blown away by the book. And after reading that and doing their workshop, I soon became their focusing students, and they became my main focusing teachers. So what's touched me the most is not just what they teach, but how they embody what they teach. Because right? we all know people who speak well, but they don't really embody it very well in their lives. You know people like that? Yeah. Pete and I really impressed me with people who are living their talk. Very warm, engaging, approachable human beings. I was really touched by that. Now, just a little background. As Jesuits, they were very much influenced by the renowned theologian and paleontologist, Teilhard de Chardin. Now, he was a stretcher bearer during World War I. He carried wounded bodies on stretchers. So he saw firsthand the horrors of war and what people can do to each other. And just so there's no confusion, I'm, I'm saying that Teilhard was a stretcher bearer in World War I, not Pete and Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Pete and Ed were stretcher bearers in the Civil War. <laughs> So yes, Pete and Ed have been around for a long time. How else can you explain how wise they've been for so many years teaching this stuff to us? So Teilhard had a vision for an institute that would study what he called human energetics. He wanted to explore the question, are there inner resources within us that have brought to the surface might make it possible to grow beyond our destructive tendencies. Is there something within us that can be tapped to help us live more peaceful, connected lives, given all the horrors he saw in his life? So there's some, something organic, some spiritual energy for life inside of us that can be awakened to guide us into a transformed way of living. Well, sad to say, Teilhard never created such an institute. But 20 years later, Guess what happened? Along came Pete and Ed. And they founded the Institute for Biospiritual Research, a nonprofit foundation that has a lot of international reach. So now enter Eugene Genwin. When Ed and Pete encountered Gene's research, a, a light bulb really went off for them. They've been familiar with the work of Carl Rogers, you know, who identified the importance of being congruent expressing feelings in a way that is connected to how we're actually experiencing them. And then he encountered Gene's work regarding the inner experiencing process. And they realized that the inner experiencing process formed the foundation for congruent living. That's really important to connect with our own inner experiencing. And they recognized that Gene's term, the felt sense, captured something that was essential not only for our emotional, for our emotional well-being, but something that was really essential for our spiritual development as well. 
So they began to envision a spirituality that tapped into the body's own knowing potential, which in turn connected us with a larger living process. So I can only imagine the rich discussions that Pete and Ed had as, the, as they were classmates at the University of Ottawa in Canada. They brought together their backgrounds in psychotherapy, the psychological investigation of religion, philosophy, and Christian theology. And they created a profound synthesis of all of that. They recognized the cultivating what, what they now call the habit of felt sensing. I love that term, the habit of felt sensing was the key to Teilhard's vision. The habit of felt sensing is the key to Teilhard's vision of a human evolution toward a more whole and connected and peace-loving human being. Here's a quote that I really love from it. Hope lies not in the mind's ability to understand, nor in the certitude that everything is going to turn out the way I want. Rather, it lies in the deep down body feel that what happens to me now has meaning and is a gift. For that to occur, our body needs to feel connected in some larger body with a history and story that includes but extends beyond my few years here on earth. And later he says something that I think is really relevant to each of us here today. This sense that I count, the sense that I count, and can risk dreaming of my contribution to a better future is what makes that future a reality. Now, let me, f let me fast forward eight, about eight years ago. Pete and Ed were living in this wonderful, comfortable piece of beautiful land in Coulterville near the Sierras, where I had the pleasure of visiting them several times. And they told me they were planning to move. And I was stunned. I said, why in the world would you want to move from this incredibly beautiful place? And then Pete said something that really made me understand what their life was about. He said, well, we want to be where the people are. We want to go to Sonora where there's more people so we can teach parents how to work with their kids using focusing. Because that's where the future lies, is with the children. So they went there and they've been teaching now parents and other leaders, other people in the community focusing for, for about eight years now or so. So that they're making a real contribution in that way. So, and this is what they write in their, on their website about this. Quote, we must turn again to family life, teaching parents how to take advantage of the open window in every young child's early years. If we truly want peaceful communities, families, and schools without violence, then we must teach children, beginning at home and in preschool, how to notice and nurture all their important feelings so their inner stories may unfold and be heard. Then with continued support at home and in school, the habit will be formed for life. So then Peter and Ed went on to write a lovely children's book that probably some of you have read. Have you seen The Little Bird Who Found Herself? Some of you read that? Nice. And it's a book that's wonderful not only for children, but for the child within all of us. And their latest book that's just came out, imagine, I'm sure Pete's going to talk about it, Rediscovering the Lost Body Connection Within Christian Spirituality. Lovely book, I've been reading it, it's a fantastic book. And it's about how our body can know and express Christian faith. But I want to quickly add that it's not just about Christian faith, it'd be of, anyone, of, be of interest to anyone who's interested in, in spiritual developments. And how that links with focus. Yeah. Very encourage you to look, check out their books. Nada Lou has videotapes available also of Pete Ned. I wanted to just say a brief story about some of the folklore about how Pete and Ed met Jean, how they became interested. It was in the late 1960s, they were completing their doctoral work, and Pete showed an article to Ed. And after reading it, Ed was so moved that he said, he said to Pete, Pete, we've got to find this guy and talk to him. They had no idea where he was. So they were able to, they were good researchers, you know, because they were, you know, 
You study theology for many years, they're in graduate school, they wrote their doctoral dissertations. So being good researchers, they figured out he was in Manhattan. <laughs> Pretty big city, might be easy to find somebody. And it was midwinter, they were in the California mountains. But after a few weeks, they found out that Gene was in New York on a sabbatical. No doubt trying to escape people like them. <laughs> who were trying to find them. So it's not easy to fly all the way from California to New York when you're not sure where somebody lives. Not sure you have the right address. Not sure he's going to open the door if you come and visit him. So it's rather gutsy. So arriving in New York, they went to where they thought he lived, knocked on the door of the apartment building, rang the bell with great trepidation, and then Jean opened the door. And there stood two young priests in their clerical suits and collars. <laughs> Maybe a little naive at that time. So they told him who they were, why they, that they'd come out to California just to see him. And then they asked rather sheepishly, can we come up and talk to you for just a little while? So they, Gene invited them in, only to discover that there was no place for the three of them to sit in Gene's apartments. <laughs> Rather sparse lifestyle. So he quickly found two crates, and he put two rug samples on the crates. And they sat on top. Gene sat on the couch, on the sofa, asked them what they wanted to talk about. So as they began to ask their questions, the reason that they came out, Gene held up his hand for them to stop. And watching Gene close his eyes, and breathing heavily, and going completely silent, in the middle of a conversation, Pete and Ed looked at each other with glances that said, what have we gotten ourselves into here? <laughs> so then just as suddenly, just as suddenly as it disappeared into silence, he opened his eyes and said to them, okay, you guys are okay. You can continue, you feel okay. <laughs> so obviously Gene was focusing on how it felt to continue the conversation. That's what I'm surmising, right? Well, wanted to throw you guys out. <laughs> but fortunately he was magnanimous and he allowed you to continue. So Gene asked, okay, what's your question? What do you want to talk about? So they asked the most important question that they brought to New York. Do the steps that you call focusing make the felt shift happen? Do the, do the steps you call focusing make the felt shift happen? Or is there another factor at work here? After a short pause, he said, no, the steps don't make it happen. That's what, that's what you guys would call grace, a gift factor. And then Pete replied, then we're in business. <laughs> history. <laughs> and a rather good one. So I said earlier that I first encountered Pete and Ed when Gene told me about their work. Well, I lied. I actually first encountered them in their book, in, in their book called Please Touch, which came out in 1969. I had read it when I was like 20. And it had not occurred to me that these were the same guys until like years later, because I had forgotten the names of the authors. And a few people know what a wonderful photographer Pete is. And that book is filled with incredible photography. Unfortunately, it's hard to come by now. But the photography that depicts the human condition. So I want to conclude with a couple of quotes from that book that will show you how long Pete and Ed have been into the focusing attitude and applying it to their work, how much it influenced them. So here's a quote from that book. We strive to believe in an invisible personal God searching with our minds alone, not knowing how to let our whole self touch the incarnate God within us. Instead of asking, how should I pray, we should ask, how can I grow? And I was reading and said, wow, these are two priests talking about this stuff? That's amazing. I mean, I've read that from two priests. How do I touch what is most real in myself and others? 
How do I touch what is most real in myself and others? I'm glad they include the others part as well. Why not let life itself teach us how to pray? Why not let life itself teach us how to pray? Developing a feel for life is developing a feel for God. I really like that. So a few months ago, Gene was worrying about Ed's health, and, and he sent an email to Pete. And he said something very touching in this email. He said, if my stuff is getting through, Gene said, if my stuff is getting through, a big part of that is your work. You've enriched so many in the focusing community. So I feel very touched to be here. Really want to honor the contribution that you, Pete, and Ed have made to my life personally, and I know to many other lives. And I sense that I've voiced the sentiments of all of us here today as we welcome you and express our heartfelt gratitude for the contribution that we have made to our world for so long and the wisdom that you brought to so many and the kind heartedness that you brought to all of us. So let's warmly welcome Peter King.